Hello everyone and welcome to another recap stream in my series of What the Cop. Uh, today's question is what the cop are we going to do about climate change? What the cop do we do now? Uh, it is the end of day three of three at the Better Futures Forum over the last uh, three nights. I have been recapping the forum uh, that ask the question, uh, what do we do between now and COP26 uh, and beyond here in Australia to make sure that we get all of our um, agenda items on the agenda of the people with the most power to do things and also how do we make sure that we make the most of our power uh, to act on climate change as well. I'd like to acknowledge that I am broadcasting to you all from uh, the land of the Turbul and Yugara people. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, we had a great acknowledgement of country as well today, as has been um, the theme across our three days. Uh, we've had three great acknowledgements to start the forum off uh, this morning. We heard from Amy Meehan. Uh, she's a regenerative, regenerative clean tech entrepreneur and she's a proud Gamilaroi Irish Australian woman. Uh, she's also based at the University of Newcastle and she spoke about the importance um, as we're heading into day three of thinking about how, uh, for those of us who are not Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, how we are going to make space for and listen to and draw attention to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives, uh, First Nations perspectives across the many nations that make up Australia as well as elsewhere, uh, talking about um, why this is such a, a I guess, all-encompassing issue but how it also impacts many um, more than others and really we heard this morning um, again and again and into the afternoon on day three a lot of uh, those themes uh, were echoed elsewhere so it was really great to hear um, the themes of things like focusing on knowledge indigenous knowledge um, and technological solutions as well um, and not just for caring for land, but knowledge systems for caring for each other as well. Uh, so that was a great start. Um, and I, as I mentioned, am on the land of the Turbul and Yugara people. So I would like to acknowledge the ongoing relationship um, that people have over tens of thousands of years uh, with land, sea um, and sky here. Uh, so. I've got, as always, a little bit of a uh, slideshow <laughs> that I'll be going through. Um, I'll just share with you the um, the program, although it is large, uh, as you will see. Um, we went into a plenary keynote address. I should take my um, actually that I must be tired because I've still got my stream starting soon sign there. That doesn't help. Um, so we went into a plenary keynote, uh, which was a great way to focus us on why we came together for Better Futures Forum. So the theme for day three is the road to Glasgow. Together we can do this. So a really um, important thing to focus our minds on is that when we say Glasgow and when I say what the COP, what I'm talking about is the Conference of Parties, the international uh, climate negotiations that are happening in Glasgow. Um, and we've got think around 80 days, maybe a bit less until uh, the um, international, uh, global leaders, governments and other um, policy advocates and um, policy analysts and also not pro not for profits, um, you know, people from all different sectors and walks of life will uh, converge virtually or otherwise on Glasgow uh, for those talks. Uh, so we wanted to uh, come together through Better Futures Forum uh, to talk about how we can better collaborate and act and raise our voices in, and raise our ambitions um, toward that. 
We first heard from Jonathan uh, Pershing, who's US Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change. And that was a really great way of uh, really getting a clear uh, idea of what's on the agenda. You know, you, we can think about so many different things that happen at these huge international talks, but um, Jonathan's uh, kind of clear way of communicating uh, the agenda and as he put it, the unfinished business that's on that agenda was really good. So um, I just want to go through some of those points uh, while we're recapping. So he said that um, the things on the agenda would be uh, that we'd be looking at getting the world to commit to uh, not just zero by 2050, but to commit to ambitious uh, targets uh, into 2030 and more short term targets than that as well. Um, he talked about the need to actually look at how we are going to make sure that all of the countries that are signed on to the Paris Agreement are actually delivering on those uh, commitments to emissions reduction. Uh, he talked about uh, the fact that Australia is one of the wealthiest countries in the world and that at a 1% contributor to global emissions, it, it is actually in the top 20 emitters in the world. So that means that Australia is well placed to set an example for the rest of the world. Um, so in under the Paris Agreement, as he explained, each country can choose their own pathway, but uh, science is telling us we need a more aggressive pathway. Uh, as a globe and certainly in Australia we do as well. Um, so he invoked other agendas. Uh, climate doesn't only rely on a narrow remit. So, you know, he encouraged us to talk to across sectors, which we're doing at this conference. Um, and he also spoke about uh, the relationship between US, the US and Australia. He was interviewed by Adam Morton, who's the climate and environment editor for Guardian Australia, um, who posed some questions to him, including about our relationship uh, with the US, uh, but how you know we've, we've seen a lot of um, yo-yoing back and forth when it comes to Australian action and inaction and ambitious and <laughs> what's the opposite of ambitious? Um, government policy or lack thereof when it comes to climate change in Australia. Um, but how we've certainly seen um, the US and other big players uh, move to be more ambitious when it comes to climate and um, implore Australia to do more. So uh, he, he um, yeah, he, he really kind of put some of these agenda items at the front of our mind um, that we not only need to make sure that everyone's meeting those targets, but also if people aren't meeting, if people, if countries aren't meeting those targets, um, we need to have ways of holding them to account and also making plans forward um, for those those countries. And he also brought up finance as another um, big issue and that we need to be calling on the wealthiest countries um, to be able to uh, pull together the funds needed to assist those developing countries who have contributed least to climate crisis and can also afford least um, to be on the front line of the impacts from climate crisis uh, to actually have a way forward. Um, we're talking mitigation and also adaptation was the other thing on the agenda. So there's a lot happening at um, Glasgow at, at the COP when everyone shows up uh, for that. Uh, everyone's got their own different agendas, but the big uh, agenda items are those which are, are, of course, all encompassing of everyone else's uh, agendas. Uh, so uh, when asked what we can do to actually uh, make sure that our government does more or to try and get Australia to do more ambitious um, ambitiously and, and more urgently on climate, um, Jonathan's response to that was, to do essentially what we're doing to um, make sure we collaborate, make sure we 
uh, focus in our efforts at the different specifics of what climate means because the climate is very all encompassing thing. Uh, it's not just an environment issue or just, you know, a uh, natural disaster issue or it's not just for one sector or another, not just an energy issue, um, but we need to uh, have representatives of all the different sectors and all the different issues and also frame it not just as a problem, but be proposing solutions um, when it comes to talking to um, political leaders they don't just want to hear what the problem is but what the opportunity is what the solution is uh how we could actually solve this problem and move forward um so focusing on those things as well really important and luckily there was no shortage of solutions uh today at at the forum um it was a big focus on action and what we can do um moving forward so we had a series of talks uh, from international leaders uh, next up, um, which was great. But at the top of that, we heard from Lisa Cliff, who's the program manager at Better Futures Australia, uh, as she was introduced by uh, Mariana Pononcio Feldman, who's the senior director of International Climate Corporation of WWF. Um, so together, they, they really announced that Better Futures Australia is actually um, going forward, going to be part of the uh, Alliance of Climate for Climate Action that uh, run under WWF, which is really making Better Futures Australia more of a global, uh, part of a global network uh, of climate action. And we certainly got a taste for this global network uh, today because we were hearing from, um, for instance, uh, we heard from Mikako Suzuki, uh, who was joining us from Japan, uh, who on behalf of Rico, uh, a tech company, which is international, she's a corporate officer in charge of ESG and risk management. Uh, and when she joined, um, we got to hear about uh, Japan's broad um, uh, both industry, business, corporations um, like hers, um, actions on climate, but also government as well and uh, how that collaboration is really important. Um, so we have had also, you're seeing up on the screen, we had uh, the shadow minister come in at the end of the day. I will get to that. Um, and you would have seen him come up on screen with Dan uh, Illich, who was the MC for the three days of the Better Futures Forum. Um, we also heard from, in our cohort of international leaders, we heard from Nguyen T. Kim Hua, who's a Deputy Director of Microfinance and Community Development Institute, or MACD. Uh, so she was talking about the importance of microfinance and the importance of social equity and focusing on these different ways that we that you can do climate action while uplifting community in Vietnam, uh, where she is based. Uh, also, we heard from um, Maria Silva, who's the general director of the Metropolitan Planning Institute. Uh, at Guadalajara Metropolitan District in, in Mexico. Uh, great to hear all the things that they were doing uh, in as one of the founding members of the Alliance uh, when it comes to energy, waste, transport. Uh, really great to hear that. And we also heard from uh, Gonzalo uh, Munoz, who's the high level champion of Chile, uh, and he's been involved with the UNFCCC um, and has a lot of experience when it comes to Chile's role in, in this. He um, was able to, I guess, bring all that together um, at the end of those talks to really give us examples of uh, ways we should really come together and move forward together. Uh, he talked about the importance of positive ambition loop in encouraging climate policies. Um, and yeah, countries like Japan, Mexico and Vietnam um, that we saw as well as Chile uh, 
they're kind of represented in this cohort are at the, are at the forefront of net zero initiatives. So it was great to see different examples from different countries and different um, political, social, environmental, um, economic context uh, uh, that was really great to see. Um, and so, yeah, BFA, um, our Better Futures Australia are joining the Climate Alliance. So that's really exciting. Um, it, it was cool to see that um, that then connected our all the delegates to a, a kind of bigger picture, um, to a, a global picture when it comes to talking about how we can be part of solutions. Because, of course, we have to remember that it's not just us in our little pocket in our own uh, professional sector or our own uh, advocacy group, community, um, or if it's a group based on identity, like age, youth groups, uh, multicultural groups, uh, we have to remember that there are um, actions happening as well as um, problems and solutions for those problems uh, all over the world. So yeah, it was a great reminder of uh, let's not uh, reinvent the wheel, but you know, find out who's got some blueprints and go from there, I guess. Um, our breakout sessions today, uh, again, they're always, always um, really inspiring. Uh, and it's always a difficulty to figure out which one you're going to go to at least first. Um, but lucky for us, uh, we get to watch the all of these things back over the next uh, few months leading up to Glasgow. Uh, so before we head into talking about the breakout sessions, I just wanted to uh, share with you something that we actually saw um, yesterday. Uh, we actually watched a recap of, of this clip from 7.30 report on ABC um, of Mary Robinson uh, speaking and, and Better Futures Forum got a little uh, mention in here as well. So let me just share that with you now and um, I'll be back. Let me try that again. <laughs> One thing that I need to make sure is that I do share audio. Uh, I had an issue with that the other day, so I think I've I think I've actually learned how to uh, troubleshoot this on the go. Mary Robinson, thank you very much for being with us this evening. There's a lot going on in the world at the moment to cause people great anxiety: COVID, climate change. You are immersed in the climate data all the time. What stops you from being overwhelmed when you see something like the IPCC report come out? From where do you derive hope? It is important uh, to be hopeful. And actually the IPCC report tells us that it is possible to stay at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is essential for the future of the world, basically, but it, it, it will require drastic action. And, you know, I have to ask myself, you know, has Prime Minister Morrison read the IPCC report? Because it is important that every country steps up ambitiously now. And in particular, Australia is out of sync with other uh, you know, Western industrialised countries. Well, our Prime Minister says that technology is the key to addressing climate change, that the world's efforts should be focused on developing countries because that's where two thirds of emissions come from. Why do you uh, object to that kind of emphasis? Well, I'm very aware of the heartbreak at the moment in the Pacific Islands. I've been there. I've been to Fiji. I've been to um, uh, Samoa. Um, I've been to the um, uh, meeting of uh, Pacific nations uh, without Australia and New Zealand, the, the forum that they have on their own, um, uh, when I was the special envoy of the Secretary General on climate change. And I heard, you know, at that time, a kind of anger. But now it's quite clear that, uh, you know, in the neighbourhood of Australia, uh, you are regarded as um, not being good neighbours. Uh, to the Pacific Islands because of the dependency still on fossil fuel. 
uh, the Secretary General has made it very clear, uh, we have to get out of fossil fuel. The International Energy Agency, uh, you know, Fatih Birol, uh, is saying we have to get out of fossil fuel. Uh, and yet Australia uh, has a policy at federal level. I know that there are states in Australia that have committed to be zero carbon, that there are cities, that this business, um, I'm very supportive of the Better Futures Forum that uh, is coming up. Um, and you know, there's a lot going on, but if at the federal level, there isn't the commitment, then it's very hard uh, to, uh, to have anything other than a kind of um, really a sense that Australia is letting itself down at the moment. What will be the effect on Australia if it doesn't transition away from fossil fuel? I think it will become a kind of pariah, to be honest, because it, this is so serious. Uh, it, it, and what I'm interested in, of course, is the climate justice dimensions. Uh, because Australia has um, had a high dependency on fossil fuel and a lot of workers in fossil fuel, it's going to need a really significant just transition and a significant just transition fund uh, the European Union, as you know, recently established a just transition uh, fund and, and a just transition mechanism for particularly coal workers in uh, Poland and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, other countries are also, countries themselves are stepping up. Uh, in Ireland, we have a just transition for peace workers whom we're having to lay off. Um, so, you know, that's part of, uh, and then uh, frankly, the approach towards Pacific Islands is also a part of a climate justice by Australia. Uh, you cannot have that conduct of neighbours that is causing such existential worry uh, for Pacific Islanders. Australia, is, as you know, is not committed to net zero emissions by 2050. How is that position likely to go down at the International Climate Change Summit in Glasgow later this year? It's quite clear that there's going to be huge pressure um, for countries not just to be net zero by 2050, but what are they going to do between now and 2030? That's what matters. The nationally determined contribution that Australia is sitting on at the moment is far, far too low. It's to reduce by um, uh, uh, 25 to 26% reduction on 2005 levels. Um, that's out of sync with what other countries, what Europe is doing, what uh, under Biden, what the United States is now doing, etc. And um, so, you know, I, I think it could be a very uncomfortable place for Australian negotiators um, because, and, and indeed, a heartfelt problem for the many businesses, the many um, citizens in Australia, the cities in Australia that are trying. Mary Robinson, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. So as you can see, um, that was Mary Robinson, their former president of Ireland. She's also the founder of the uh, Mary Robinson Foundation. Her, she's got a passion uh, when it comes to climate justice. And uh, she has also served uh, as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights as well. And she has a book on climate justice to the Mary Robinson Foundation, uh, by the way, is has climate justice at its centre and um, really looks to, to tackle climate justice issues. She also mentioned um, that uh, same thing that we heard uh, earlier today, uh, which is about the need for countries to be paying into funds that look to bring about climate justice um, internationally. So. That was another theme um, that was great to see uh, echoed. Um, hopefully it's heated as well. Uh, so that brings us uh, some of the way through this recap. If you've just joined, hi, I'm Lee Constable. I'm a climate communicator. I'm a online a TV and online presenter, although during the pandemic, it's been more online, would you believe? Um, and I've also been over the last three days attending the Better Futures Forum, uh, which was put on by Better Futures Australia to bring together people from across sectors, across communities, community groups, organisations, uh, leaders and people who are um, individuals looking to make a change and looking for a better future. So what, what I've been doing each day, um, the last two days and now tonight, is recapping each day and, and trying to get the word out there about what 
you missed. Um, this series is called What the Cop? Because I think there's a lot of confusion, including um, for myself, when it comes to what happens at international climate negotiations like COP and what, if any, power I have as an individual to do anything about that. Uh, Better Futures Forum is definitely a place where we can see that it's a place to make some change um, and to try and be the change and reach out to other people making change in various ways ways. Uh, so our breakout groups was the next thing I was going to break into. Um, we had a range of different topics on offer just as for people on the pathway uh, to zero emissions is the first that I'll talk about, um, where we had uh, speakers uh, talking about First Nations knowledge, action, impacts, uh, solutions when it comes to climate change. So um, we heard from, uh, from a, a range of different speakers on that justice topic. Uh, we heard from Willie, Lu uh, Willie Luisi, who's the president of Ojai in, in, in Tonga. He's, um, one of the climate ambassadors for the kingdom of Tonga. So it was great to hear him. Uh, we heard from Kira Sherwood O'Regan, who's co-founder and impact director at Activate Agency. Uh, she, she was speaking also as a Maori woman as well uh, in this context. And also we heard from uh, Ray Minicon, who's come up before um, in the conference. I spoke about him um, doing the acknowledgement of a country on day one. Uh, and Ray is a pastor and he's also an executive member of the Indigenous Peoples Organisation of Australia. And that uh, session was headed up by Professor Don Henry from Melbourne Enterprise. Um, professor, he's a professor of environmentalism at University of Melbourne and he's also on the international board um, for the Climate Reality Project, which is Al Gore's um, project we see uh, internationally. Um, so it it was a really great discussion um, seeing, you know, Ray Minicon um, from uh, his perspective as an Aboriginal man and a, and a pastor talking about um, his, uh, his look at climate change, as well as Willie talking about uh, the Tongan perspective and Kira bringing in Maori perspectives. Uh, one great synergy across all three speakers was they, they talked about um, their different cultures actually having a shared notion of, um, as it was put, looking uh, looking backwards to walk into the future. Um, I think I might have butchered how that, how you would phrase that more elegantly, but basically learning from the ancestors and many generations past um, to plan for the future. And, and also um, Ray brought up uh, planning for seven generations and Kira did as well. Um, and the idea of not having this kind of colonial short sighted view where we're worried about the next election cycle or tomorrow, next year, you know, um, or one or two generations, but really looking um, deep into the future and deep back into the past um, to learn and to bring bring wisdom and knowledge forward. So um, it was great to talk uh, to hear from these speakers. Kira also pointed out importantly that although um, sovereignty, you know, hasn't been ceded. And although First Nations are sovereign people, um, their sovereignty isn't recognised in the UN. So we really, they really rely on um, getting seats at the table through um, national governments uh, and national bodies. So really encouraging people. One thing we can do when it comes to actions is, is seed space, as she put it, um, for Indigenous voices and Indigenous knowledge um, that is uh, shared by Indigenous people and guided by them as well, rather than packaged up uh, and, um, and having Indigenous voices put to the side. So um, it, was, it was a really great talk um, from all three speakers uh, from all three places as well. Uh, 
because we had uh, obviously the Tongan perspective, Maori perspective, um, and of course there are over 250 different First Nations of Australia, um, but Uncle Ray at least brought his perspective um, as part of the Indigenous Peoples Organisation of Australia, as well as his personal um, take in culture when it comes to uh, looking at the problems and how Indigenous people are more impacted by climate change, but Indigenous culture and knowledge has been one that um, has cared for, for country for, for tens of thousands of years. So really uh, looking to Indigenous peoples as, as leaders um, as well. So um, uh, that was just one of four breakout sessions. We had a session called Cities Race to Zero. Um, that was uh, one with a lot of different speakers talking about metropolitan areas uh, getting to zero emissions. Uh, and really um, part of that focus was on um, local councils, mayors um, being part of that. Uh, so cities race to zero. Um, uh, we heard about uh, driving a green and just recovery. Um, there, there are uh, cities race to zero numbers. I'll give them to you now. There's 733 cities involved, five are from Australia. Um, so that was uh, great to hear, but obviously more work to be done there. And um, something that can be done is coming together with ambition to recruit a thousand cities um, from Australia. So step cities are taking next. So city of, of Melbourne has Power Melbourne. Um, Sydney powered by wants is aiming to be powered by 100% renewables. Um, there's a yeah, there's a lot happening when it comes to cities and energy. So Adelaide as well, um, and uh, looking to um, have the first carbon neutral plan electric charging station um, and incentives for uptake of sustainable technology. Uh, so their key themes are zero food waste. Um, they're also looking at EVs and solar sharing. Uh, so the speakers at the cities are race to zero and it was cool. Uh, Phrasing it as a race to zero, yes, it is a race, so let's try and <laughs> get there as quickly as possible. Um, but phrasing it as a race to zero was really good. Uh, so on that panel was um, Dr. Kathy Oki, who's um, from University of Melbourne. Uh, uh, she is part of uh, Melbourne Enterprise um, She's a senior fellow in Informed Cities in the Connected Cities Lab. Uh, we also had Andy Deakin, Managing Director of Global Co Covenant of Mayors. Uh, Rohan Lepart, who's the Councillor and Chair of Environment Portfolio at City of Melbourne. Uh, Mayor Susan Aitken, who's uh, from the City of Glasgow, uh, where obviously COP is being hosted. Uh, this year, Jess Scully, the Deputy Mayor of the City of Sydney, Trent McCarthy, who's the Councillor from Darabin City Council, uh, Darcy Pimblett, who's a Program Development Manager at Cities Power Partnership, um, and Michelle English, who's Associate Director of Parklands Policy and Sustainability at the City of Adelaide. So lots of different cities um, locally and even globally represented there. Um, Beyond that, we also had, uh, we've had a really strong health contingent um, all the way through Better Futures Forum. It's been great to see how uh, we've seen that people are looking at health and climate hand in hand more and more. Uh, so this one was prioritising health in the national climate response um, on that. Uh, topic was Professor Taryn uh, Wiramanthi, who's President of Public Health Association of Australia, Associate Professor Ying Zhang, who's uh, co-chair um, of the MJA Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change for Australia, Dr Georgie Behrens, who's board member of Doctors for the Environment, uh, and Dr Diarmid uh, Campbell-Lendrum, who's uh, team leader of climate change and health at World Health Organization. So another great topic on health we heard yesterday about uh, the healthcare sector becoming more green themselves when it comes to reducing their sector's emissions. Um, and today looking at um, prioritizing health when it comes to a national climate response. 
Uh, obviously, there are health issues that are ongoing, public health issues related to climate change, but there are also um, crises in public health related to climate change, um, things that come up all of a sudden, as well as things that are more a gradual creep, uh, like air quality can be. Um, so there were many opportunities identified to reduce emissions and a path to zero. Um, not just the, the sector itself, but a green recovery from the pandemic was also mentioned. Um, building community resilience. So talking not just about mitigation, but adaptation. Um, and to looking at a national strategy for climate, health and wellbeing. Um, also, stopping funding and subsidising uh, polluting sources was something that was mentioned as really important. And uh, we've heard from representatives of doctors um, for the environment uh, over the years uh, talking about the impact uh, that coal mines, for example, have on the local community's air quality and health and respiratory issues, um, not just asthma, but also respiratory issues um, for everyone. Um, looking at uh, establishing a sustainable development unit um, was one of the things that was outlined and um, it was important, uh, an important statement in this was um, we need to build climate and health awareness into health campaigns and that climate is actually the biggest health challenge of the 21st century. I think often it's uh, health and climate haven't been put on the same agenda and uh, that's both climate going on the agenda for health and health going on the agenda for climate. But it's great to hear um, after all of the effort of um, these people in, these, um, in this forum and others like them that this is becoming more and more of a... Um, uh, an issue that's talked about hand in hand because, because it is. Uh, so actions for the future, developing the national climate and health strategy, developing a national assessment on health system vulnerability was really important. Um, collective efforts from multiple sectors in health. Um, there's a, a distributing the climate countdown report and recognizing health as the most positive angle for action on climate. I think uh, healthcare workers' voices have always been highly respected in our um, community, both locally and internationally. Um, and that's been the case throughout the pandemic as well, but it's definitely the case as well when it comes to speaking on the need for climate action. Um, so it's been uh, really important that we see uh, that happening more and more. Um, greening the health systems, developing climate resilience strategies for health systems, and also leveraging privilege, which is a really great way of phrasing it in people's um, professions and, and circles of influence. Uh, apart from health, uh, which was great to see um, come to such a, a, a positive and, and practical steps forward kind of place after all of the, the different breakouts on health and climate over the three days. Um, we had uh, another breakout session on scaling finance to drive action. Finance is obviously a big important thing for anyone in any place, um, even and perhaps especially in um, countries like Australia where we need to, we're one of the wealthiest countries, but we still have disparities um, in the distribution of that wealth for things like climate action here and elsewhere in in the world. Um, so the opportunities uh, for a path to zero emissions um, for smart investment. Uh, there are huge opportunities in climate constrained in carbon constrained Australia. Um, investment in nature based solutions. Uh, and also looking at investments in embodied carbon, scope three emissions, those are those up and downstream emissions uh, we spoke about the other day, strategies for dealing with those, transmission and networking needs for the electricity grid, hydrogen and soil carbon. Uh, so Australia, as I mentioned, is a wealthy nation in the Asia Pacific region. So it has a role uh, in ensuring there's investment in mitigation strategies, but also in the adaptation space as well, because obviously we are not just stopping climate change. It is here. <laughs> it is happening. So we need to both stop future um, emissions 
and we need to uh, be able to address and adapt to and cope with uh, the changes that are happening now and how they are impacting people and the planet. Um, so on this topic of finance, uh, there were five speakers, Monica Richter, who's Senior Manager of Low Carbon Communities at World Wildlife Fund, uh, Mara Bunn, who's Chair of the Australian Impact Investments, Neil Salisbury, who's CEO and MD at Point Advisory, uh, Sebastian Lowenstein, who's uh, Associate Director of Sustainability at CEFC, and Patrick John Martin, who's a climate finance expert. Uh, so uh, in bold here is written the creation of extra fiscal space for developing nations. I think that's really important, especially in the Pacific, um, by cancelling debt and return for action uh, on impacts of COVID and climate. Uh, so we've really seen a discussion dur during the pa pandemic about addressing um, economic issues from the pandemic hand in hand with addressing climate issues, recognising that uh, we need to move to a new normal in every way uh, when it comes to climate and health and the way that our economic systems support um, better health and better climate. Um, and there was a sentiment that we need to encourage investors to invest in positive solutions on climate change. And that's through improving information, demonstrating a value proposition, and where needed using public investments to get new industries, give them a chance to scale up rapidly and become investment priorities. And that's definitely something that can happen in Australia, um, given the huge uh, opportunities, uh, innovation, resources, uh, smarts <laughs> that we have here. So um, there was an acknowledgement that we need investors to actively engage with big resource companies to change. And we have seen shareholders of huge uh, fossil fuel companies having an impact when it comes to um, preventing fossil fuels from uh, being able to go unquestioned on certain issues like destroying sacred sites, for example. So we are seeing investors um, taking notice of the outside pressures. Um, obviously, we can always do more on that. Um, so what I, um, what I wanted to uh, talk about now um, was the exciting, uh, I guess, end to the day. <laughs> we, we had quite um, an exciting array of speakers every day, and and today the third of three was no no different um, in the, in that regard. Uh, we did see the Honourable Chris Bowen, uh, who's the MP, uh, he's who's an MP in Fairfield, currently actually in lockdown, um, that area of Sydney. So hello if you're out there in lockdown. Uh, actually in so many places are in lockdown right now. Uh, he's also the Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Uh, so he's a, a Labor MP. Um, the Minister um, for Emissions Reduction was invited to join, but um, clearly he was busy on other business. But we did hear from the Shadow Minister, Chris Bowen. Uh, he was... Um, he, he spoke about... Um, clearly we haven't had... Uh, a 2050 zero target even um, confirmed by our federal government. And he spoke about uh, the fact that 2050, zero by 2050 is needed. And he spoke about the fact that that is not only needed, but also insufficient. Um, as has been outlined in the IPCC report um, and you know, has as has been talked about even before the recent IPCC report, um, net zero by 2050 um, is a commitment that hasn't been made, but um, he said that he is committed to net zero by 2050, um, but has not made a commitment for 2030. And Dan Illich did try to question him on that. And a lot of um, people in the audience were in the chat saying they would love to hear the short term goals. Um, but at this stage, uh, the Labor Party are not um, budging on revealing any short term goals 
um, obviously leading up to election, they <laughs> are deciding to stay tight-lipped on what their goals would be, but at least um, commit to net zero by 2050, which is something we have not seen our federal government do. Um, he said that uh, he wants to support the re renewable energy sector, decarbonise the Australian economy, he wants to support jobs, especially in those communities where the transition um, means changing the local economy and what that relies on. Um, and so putting jobs um, on the agenda for those communities was definitely part of what he spoke about. Uh, he spoke about creating new jobs uh, through these these new sectors. Um, and um, I think one of the things he said about the recent IPCC report uh, was that there's agency and urgency. I thought that was a clever little, I mean, that's why he said it, right? Politicians, they're great at this. Um, meaning that, you know, there's urgency, things happen, need to happen now, um, but there's also agency in that there are still things that we can do. Um, so necessary but not sufficient is the net zero by 2050 quote uh, that he gave. Um, but we can't begin that, as he said, by 2049. Uh, he spoke about the issues with uh, climate denial in the Conservative um, government. He spoke about um, that our target pales in comparison to other countries. Um, that Australia's emissions do matter. Um, he spoke about uh, the fact that we can't, we are uh, the world's 14th biggest emitter and that we can't just wait for the other 13 to do more. Um, and yeah, Australia, he said, will only persuade others when we get our house in order. Um, he wanted to also, um, yeah, talk about the regions impacted, as I mentioned, and um, talk about apprenticeships for new industries as well and upskilling and transitioning um, workers from uh, those, those industries that would be uh, suffering and impacted most um, by transitions from fossil fuels. Um, he also was was fairly uh, negative about uh, some of the the recent action we've seen. Um, for instance, he said that, um, or activism, I should say, that we've seen. He said that change doesn't happen um, because of last minute convoys of condescension. Uh, obviously, referring to the last election and the um, convoy up the east coast of Australia against Adani. Um, and also mentioned that change doesn't happen um, by doing graffiti or something like that, which I think was a reference to uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, so clearly, <laughs> clearly, um, he he sees the Labor Party as as the the best way forward. Um, that's not a surprise, uh, but that we would see a Labor politician um, advocate for for their party in that way. Um, again, not giving a target for 2030, but saying that they, unlike the current government, would commit to zero by 2050 and um, saying that the, the current government needs to commit to interim targets as well. Um, so that was a really interesting chat. Um, it was great to see that, you know, a, a forum like Better Futures that we all know is um, really important and impactful is getting a lot of attention from uh, these big uh, key players in uh, our local Australian and international um, climate negotiations and actions. Um, speaking of which, Alok Sharma, um, who is the president of COP26, so one coming up in Glasgow, um, and a, a British MP. Uh, he spoke, um, we saw a pre-recorded message from him to us, uh, and he spoke with 
great passion about uh, the window of time to prevent these effects getting far, far worse um, is closing. And, and he talked about the urgency. Um, he talked about, la he said last month, a month's worth of rain fell in London in 24 hours. And London uh, by reputation is quite rainy. So that that's quite a lot of rain. Uh, he said that COP26 is critical and so must be the moment um, that every country and every part of society embraces their responsibility to protect our pre precious planet and pointed out we've got 70 days left to Glasgow COP26. Uh, so we need to push harder. He called on Australia to step up their commitment. He urged Australia to step up um, with big and bold commitments before Glasgow, uh, which was great to hear from Alok Sharma. Um, and he talked about the need to drive down emissions to keep below the 1.5 degrees Celsius target and keep that within reach. Um, and that all countries need to make uh, net zero by middle of the century and short term targets. And I'd say uh, middle of the century is what we're hearing would be far too late to be aiming to, to get to zero. So. Uh, he also spoke about finance, as we heard from Mary Robinson, as we heard from uh, our speakers uh, from finance and economics and, and from people talking about equity and climate justice. Everywhere we're talking about um, finance and that the ado adequate um, finance task ahead is is near impossible, he said, both but it's it's required. So both public and private money is needed to to actually um, tackle this issue for for developed countries to deliver a hundred billion dollars a year. Um, so that needs to happen. So that developed uh, developed countries need to deliver that. So that developing countries, again, the countries who actually have uh, contributed the least to emissions, but have are most impacted by climate crisis. Um, uh, that's, that's, it's only <laughs> fair, I would say. So it was great to hear him talk about that. So working together, he said, would include civil society, business, youth, faith, indigenous peoples, he also mentioned, which was good to hear. Um, and so the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero campaign uh, is what he encouraged countries to get on board with um, and finance organisations. So he said that Indigenous people's knowledge is key. So it was good to hear um, particularly a British uh, representative um, who is president of COP uh, mention Indigenous people's knowledge being key, especially given the comments that we heard um, from our speakers in our session about justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous and First Nations people across the Pacific, um, that often uh, that knowledge is being co-opted, packaged, they are being put aside. Um, and so it was good to hear that at least mentioned, so hopefully more than lip service there. Uh, he did say the clock is ticking, time's running out. We need a fairer, cleaner, greener future for us all. And I think we can all agree. Um, so buoyed by this, we went into a discussion on identifying and responding to climate change priorities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So uh, we again uh, had the honour of hearing from uh, Pastor Ray Minicon as well as Kat Catherine uh, Etok, who's the co-chair of Indigenous Peoples Organisation of Australia. Uh, Dr. Janine Mohammed, we heard from, who's CEO of the Lawitcha Institute, and Dr. Virginia Marshall, executive member of the Indigenous Peoples Organisation of Australia. And through that discussion, uh, we heard a, a, real, um, a real call to action uh, for everyone uh, in all sectors in all community groups to be thinking about centering, reaching out, listening, uh, reading, learning, and um, acting on uh, the issues, concerns, knowledge, wisdom, um, and cultural um, influence of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the over 200 and 50 nations, um, First Nations, that make up what we now call Australia. Uh, 
Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Marshall both mentioned um, Indigenous science and also the fact that colonisation has meant often meant erasure of Indigenous knowledge. Um, it has actually held people um, back. It has held us back even now, given that even things like the seasons and how those play out in the Australian landscape across the many different climates and geographical uh, landscapes that make up these many nations was uh, summarised and uh, written over as four seasons um, from the, you know, English, British perspective and European perspective. Um, so that was a, a good example of of a thing across the board um where we've seen that um you know we've had tens of thousands of years of um people living on and being custodians of custodianship came up today how it custodianship of the land is not seeing um yourself as human as separate or better than the land, the waterways, the sky, the animals, the plants, um, but part of it. And I think that um, that idea of custodianship and as Re Uncle Ray Minikun put it, um, that idea of having treaty not just with people but with the land was something that was emphasised again. So it was um, a really great note to bring everyone together on um, at this conference and really I think um, you know hopefully will lead to more collaboration and action uh, when it comes to climate justice in Australia. Um, and finally uh, we had four speakers uh, round out the day. Well, um, to we had uh, three speakers join Dan Illich, the MC, uh, to give some takeaways. So uh, those four voices, uh, those three voices, sorry, were Tahin, uh, uh, sorry, Tahin Tanvir, who's a 20-year-old policy advisor. He's also an author and a multicultural youth advocate. Um, we heard from Dr. Rebecca Huntley, who's an author and researcher and independent consultant, and she's also Australia's foremost expert on social trends when it comes to climate uh, attitudes and perspectives in Australia, and Kelly O'Shaughnessy, who's the CEO of Australian Conservation Foundation. Uh, so some takeaways um, and closing remarks uh, were that there are solutions um, that we don't need delay. Uh, we also heard uh, Jihan talked about the importance of the youth perspective and including and giving voices to youth and to um, people from diverse backgrounds, multicultural backgrounds, a diversity of different types of people being part of climate action and having a stake in their own future, whatever impact um, climate might have on that. Uh, uh, Rebecca Huntley actually talked about how we're seeing that people across Australia overwhelmingly um, care about climate change and that is actually regardless of the way they vote. So it's great to see that um, attitudes and perspectives on climate have changed and certainly I don't think any government elected um, in Australia can claim that votes for them were votes against climate action because we're seeing that that is not the case um, when we look at the research. So um, Kelly O'Shaughnessy also said that um, ACF have done a huge poll on climate and she gave some teasers but wouldn't actually spill the beans but that will be out in the next month and she said that that would go to to um, dispelling some myths about who thinks what when it comes to climate change. Um, and there was a, a sentiment across all three of these closing speakers that when we talk to people, whether they're family, people on the street, I mean, people on the virtual street if you're in lockdown, um, loved ones, social groups, uh, faith groups that we really um, talk about, meet people where they are and talk about what they value and care about um, and really, you know, 
talk about the issues, but also talk about the opportunities. I think we can get very caught up in doom and gloom, but it's only doom and gloom if we don't have solutions and we have plenty. <laughs> so um, that really rounded out the day. And then um, I'll share with you now a few of the uh, illustrations from Devin Bunce, who was the um, illustrator, uh, visual scribe uh, who was um, at the conference. Uh, Devin did uh, a lot of different um, images throughout the time there, uh, but we uh, we got to see them kind of in action as as we, uh, I'll just slide these over, all analog style. Um, we got to see a lot of the different thoughts played out through these beautiful illustrations. So uh, if you follow Better Futures Australia, they're on, um, Better Futures Australia are on all of the social media. I'm streaming right now in LinkedIn on the Better Futures Australia LinkedIn page. Um, but they also have Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and of course their website. So if you keep an eye out, you'll be able to see the completed um, visual illustrations of all the different um, ideas and actions and sentiments shared over the three days. Um, and that was illustrated by Devin Bunce again. So great to see her talents played out. And speaking of talents being played out, we um, ended the day uh, with an awesome poetic performance. Um, and we got to hear what it's like to have a conference, a takeaways from a conference over three days um, and reflections from that uh, turned into a great uh, piece of art in spoken word by uh, Joel McCarrow, who's, who's a writer and speaker and poet. Um, so that was an awesome um, and uplifting end to the day. So that really rounds out uh, day three of three. There's lots to think about. I've learned so much over the last three days. Um, I didn't think I'd ever engage this much with a virtual conference because, you know, it can be hard to, to connect virtually. Um, so it was all in all a great experience. And I think... Um, We've had some great networking going on throughout this as well and lots of sharing of information, sharing of contact details um, and also coming together to talk about shared goals and shared actions that we can take um, into the future. So if you're looking for um, this is just uh, just thanks to the sponsors, uh, by the way, since I'm streaming into Better Futures Australia, LinkedIn, there, there were four sponsors, Hester Super, South Pole, and we heard from a representative of South Pole today talking about um, how this actual event was made uh, carbon neutral and climate neutral. So great to see. Officeworks also planted a tree for every attendee, which Dan Illich, the MC, loved to say because it rhymes. And The Guardian in Australia is the media sponsor. So um, if you're looking for more information, uh, Better Futures Australia does have a website and I know that they're going to be putting together a kind of highlights reel video. Um, so go to betterfutures.org.au if you want to check out more about how you can get involved. Uh, there is a declaration you can sign. So I'm just sharing the website here. Um, you can join in. You can sign the declaration. Um, here you can share your story as well if you've got a climate um, story to share and you can attend an event so if you want to take action and you want to find out more about what's happening with your community or sector or start that even and be a part of that this is where you can go you can also meet our climate champions including farmers like peter holding that we heard talk over the time um, Catherine Etoch is another person who we heard talk. Um, so you can meet the climate champions and ambassadors and have a look around at different ways you can be part of this change, a positive change for a better future. Um, I think uh, really this has been um, 
yeah, this has been a lot to digest. I'm ready to just ferment on this for a good few days and then jump back into um, finding out more about how I can lend my climate communication skills to this community. Um, we have a lot of people to reach and the more people we have as part of this, uh, the more we can be across all of the problems and potential solutions and the people that we need to reach in that. So make sure that wherever you are, and again, I've got people watching on Twitch. Hello. Sorry. Usually when you're on Twitch, you're spending a lot of time reading out comments and engaging more with the chat. Um, but I'm across too many different platforms at the moment on Facebook and YouTube Live as well. Hi, if you've been watching there. And I'm also streaming here on the Better Futures Australia LinkedIn page. So thanks for watching or watching back as the case may be. Uh, look after yourselves because it's only if you look after yourself that you can look after the planet and make sure to find out more about uh, any of the things that I've brought up um, or anything you might be wondering when it comes to climate change, climate action, climate solutions. Um, reach out uh, and betterfutures.org.au. That's a good place to start. So thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening. And that's it from me. See you later.